Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You know, I can't see as far back as where you all sat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to believe you're back there. <laughs> Keep laughing. Um, I understand it's Christy Dietrich's birthday today, so happy birthday, Christy. Happy birthday. Yes. I would also ask for your prayers this coming week for uh, Joy Keeler. Uh, Clayton, she's on baby watch now. She's just about due. And it's always nice to know that the support of the congregation is with you. So prayers for her. Um, I wanted to talk to you about what we're going to do during Advent this year. Dale said I could do whatever I wanted. <laughs> so I think we need more joy. We need more hope, and we need more involvement from people. So we're going to do that in a number of ways. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is we have some craft projects for the congregation to do. And if you don't do your craft projects, there won't be much on the tree, because the only thing we're having on the tree this year are lights and projects that we made. The first thing that we're doing, which we have to do, before Advent starts, which is the last Sunday of November, is we're going to make paper chains. Now, paper chains are a simple thing. You probably made them as a child. And that's the whole reason behind using paper chains. Even a little two-year-old can help you make paper chains. So we're going to ask every member of the congregation and all the kids to make hunks of paper chains to be put together. And that's what we're going to start the tree with. So on the first Sunday in Advent, we'll have a tree and lights and paper chains that we all made. The next Sunday, and I will need some people to help with, with, the, with the two craft projects that I have set up. The next Sunday, we're going to make Swedish heart. Um, have you seen the woven Swedish hearts that have a little pocket in them? They're very easy to make. We're going to make those to put on the tree. And the third Sunday, we have a very simple... Um, angel craft project that's made from ribbons and a little round ball and some um, some elastic ties. So simple things, but things that we made that say we are stronger together, we can transform our space together, together we can be more than we are apart. Hopefully that'll bring a few more people into church just to see what the tree looked like and then we got it done. We have, a, we have a little 5x7 um, pad of paper out there. You can put your fav favorite Christmas carols on that list. And what we don't get um, scheduled during the Sundays in Advent, we will use for the, um, the first Sunday after, at, after Christmas to have a, a, more like a hymn sing worship service. So all the songs that we didn't get to sing that we wanted to before Christmas, we'll sing right after Christmas. So those are just a few things that are coming up. My mind is still working. Stay tuned. The next time I preach is on the 31st. And after church on the 31st, anybody who can read music, we want you to uh, stay for a few minutes after worship and learn this piece, Go Now in Peace. Uh, it's a piece that we're going to use as a response for um, the benediction all during Advent. And Here's, here's the aha moment about that one. I came with my 20 copies of Go Down in Peace, which I've used in other churches before, and Faye had heard it online in a church service and had ordered some copies herself, not knowing what I was doing. This is meant. So if you can read music, or even if you just like to sing and want a heads up on, on a piece we'll be doing every Sunday in Advent at the end of the service, stay up at church on the 31st and work with us to learn this piece. Dale, do you have any announcements? No. Nothing from Dale. Anybody else have any announcements they want to bring up? Yes. I didn't know if you could see back that far or not, so I just wanted to. I saw the hands. I couldn't see the face. I know the voice. <laughs> uh, good morning, everybody. Good, 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 good news from the search committee. Uh, things are progressing very, very well, and I would like to inform you as to where we are right now. Uh, our pastoral candidate, Pastor Deb Kunkel 
will be here the weekend of 12, 13, and 14 uh, of November. That's before deer hunting, folks, so don't worry. Um, on, the, uh, on, the, on Saturday, the, the uh, 13th, um, she has asked for a meet and greet uh, type thing. Um, both Cochrane and St. John's will have that. Uh, Cochrane's is from 11 to 1. Uh, St. John's is from 4 to 6. Uh, it's just come meet the pastor. There will be some uh, snacks and, and uh, things around. Um, you don't have to stay. Just come in and, and introduce yourself and say hi uh, and enjoy the time with hopefully all the other folks that are around. The reason that I say both times is because if something does not work for you um, from 4 to 6 and you would still like to shake hands and meet Pastor Deb, um, feel free to go to Cochrane. They will be doing the same if something doesn't work for them. Uh, they are welcome to come down here and uh, meet and greet Pastor Deb as well. On Sunday then, um, Cochran's service is at 8 a.m. Uh, with Pastor Deb for her trial sermon with them, and they will vote immediately after the service. Our service is at, a, excuse me, at 11 a.m. Uh, on that Sunday. We will vote immediately uh, after the service, uh, and we will go from there. The parsonage is well underway. Um, the consistory met uh, Wednesday night, uh, and things are, the ramp as you have seen is completed outside, uh, meets all of the ADA standards that it's supposed to meet, and uh, we still have a couple questions inside and we are eagerly awaiting her to come uh, so that we can get our answers uh, from directly from her and we will proceed as we need to um, from there. Uh, one last thing, there will be a letter going out uh, to all of the people of the congregation as we have um, names and addresses for uh, and saying just what I've said to remind everyone uh, that this is going to be happening. Please folks mark this on your calendar, pass the word uh, to anybody that you think might be interested. This is very important to her and very important to us that we get off on the right foot here. Um, not that there is a wrong foot probably, but I guess I would just like to have a real strong showing uh, if we can um, at all possible. So with that in mind, thank you for your thoughts and prayers from the search committee and uh, good luck to us as we enter the next next chapter uh, at St. John's. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. If you haven't ever served on a search committee, you don't realize what an incredible amount of work it is. Each church had to put together a, a document about their congregation. And it was about 37 pages long. I read the one from St. John's. Um, I, I didn't read the one from Cochran. Um, but it's just an, amount, an immense amount of work to, to filter through profiles that they get, to, to make those contacts, to try to show people what they could experience here in this place. Um, it'd be really nice if we had more than 20 people there the day she, she preaches for her trial sermon. Get as many people as possible. Steve's absolutely right. You want to you want to make a strong showing on that particular day. It's been a long time coming, and I'm I'm totally delighted that soon I can hang up my preaching hat again. <laughs> Anything else? We thank you for filling in. It has been a joy to do it. Um, I've preached to you through cancer and kidney disease and a stroke. And I don't think I ever would have come back from all those things nearly as well if I hadn't had you with me. You have been a blessing to me. Please stand with me and join me in all worship. In the name of the triune God, the Creator, Christ, and the Holy Spirit, let us enter worship asking for strength and guidance. Our opening hymn is number 18. <laughs>
superb invocation. Holy dwelling place, your tent is wide enough to provide shelter for all who seek you, food for all who hunger, and healing for all who suffer. Meet us here today and fill us with confidence in your presence that we may risk sharing Jesus' cup and his baptism so the world may become the place of love and justice you desire for all. Shelter us with your light and clothe us with your heavenly garments. Teach us how we may best serve ourselves and one another on this daring adventure. Amen. Let us come before God, being honest about our lives, our thoughts, and our deeds. Please join with me in the prayer of confession. Divine Shepherd, like sheep we go our own ways, with our heads to the ground, and our attention turned elsewhere. We often fail to heed the gentle nudge of your staff and your calls for home. With so many things to distract us, work, school, and the general busyness of life, we lie unresponsive to your calls to the kingdom of service. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Jesus we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in our hope of sharing the glory of God. Amen. Our first lesson today is from Job, the 38th chapter, verses 1 through 7, and verses 34 through 41. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up their loins like a man, I will question you and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? For who had laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Can you lift up your voice to the clouds so that a flood of water may cover you? Can you send forth lightnings so that they may go and say to you, Here we are? Who has put wisdom in the inward parts? or give an understanding to the mind. Who has the wisdom to number the clouds? Or who can tilt the water skins of the heavens when the dust runs into a mass and the clouds cling together? Can you hunt the prey for the lion? Or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens? Or lie in wait in their covert? Who provides for the raven its prey? when its young ones cry to God, or wander about for a lack of food. Here ends the first lesson. The epistle lesson is from Hebrews, the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 10. Every high priest chosen from among mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is subject to weakness. And because of this, he must offer sacrifice for his own sins, as well as for those of the people. And one does not presume to take this honor, but take it only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears 
to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of the eternal salvation for all who obey him. Having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Here ends the epistle lesson. And the gospel lesson for today is from St. Mark, the 10th chapter, verses 35 through 40 something. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said, Teacher, we want to do for us whatever you ask. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand, and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Our next hymn is number 43. Thank you.
more words than songs. I want to sing more words. Okay, so we have three scripture passages today, and each one of them says something about the relationship of God and God's people. The first one is from Joel, and we've heard that before. I know I preached on this passage from Joel before in this place since I've been preaching for you. Um, it's, at the, it's at the end of all Job's trouble and turmoil, and while he hasn't cursed God and died, um, he's started to wonder the thing that people often wonder when they come into just a cataclysm of, of problems, why me, Lord? To which God answers, wait a minute, you don't really have a right to question me. Were you the one that made everything? Were you the one who keeps everything in balance? Why do you question me? And we see before us in that passage the idea of God as transcendent being, of God apart from the creatures God created. Wanting something specific from them in terms of, of faith and prayer and the way they live, but staying apart enough that the response to Job's questions, why me, Lord, evoked some pretty harsh words from God. The people continued to think about God as being other, as being apart from them, as being so transcendent and separate from them that they couldn't even really comprehend what the glory of God was. And God tried over the course of the whole Old Testament to find ways to, to bring people into a, into a balance where they both appreciated the majesty and understood that everyday life was supposed to also be about God. But they had trouble with that. They had trouble because they, they either chastised God the way they would chastise a child, which God really didn't like very much, or they would, they would be so in awe that they didn't listen for what God was trying to tell them and find the directions God was trying to lead them in. And so, in the fullness of life, something that had been promised for generation upon generation upon generation happened. And God sent them a form of divinity that was something they could understand. In Christmas we say God came down to earth in the form of a baby. Jesus came that he might embody both what is divine and what is human. And that Jesus would walk the paths that humans walk, would see the struggles, would see the pain, would see the fear, would see all the limitations human creatures have, and help them to be able to go beyond those limitations to find a path that led to God. That's what the epistle's talking about. They're talking about Jesus being called to do that. And for ministers down the centuries, down the millennia, to also need that call, to only speak those words of truth if God calls you to do that. Being called to be a pastor is an awesome thing. It took me a long time to figure out I actually was called. And I've shared that with you before. My, my, my college teachers knew it way before I did. I thought I was going to play a pit orchestra for the rest of my life and listen to musicals. <coughs> To be called to speak the word that needs to be said in a manner so that people can hear it. 
That's what Jesus brought into reality. Something beyond rules and regulations kept, not because you understood them, but because they were written in a book someplace or told you by somebody and so you keep the rules. But to live so that you try to be as one with the divine, as one with God, as you possibly can. To listen to what is being said to you by God. To defer to God every time you preach so that the words that need to be spoken are the ones that come out of your mouth. And to trust God to give you those words. That's what it means to be a preacher in the truest sense. It's awesome. And it's absolutely not, like nothing else in the world. To feel God's presence. We come together to feel God's presence among us. And to open our minds and our hearts to what is being sung and, and spoken and read. To see where we fit into God's plans. Because even if you're not called to be a preacher, you're called to do something in God's kingdom. You're called to be a person of faith, a person who uses his or her gifts to the glory of God, who sees the world around and sees the needs and tries to make certain that the needs of the people in the world are met. There are so many ways to do that. And no one person can do them all. It takes the powers of every person working for the kingdom to make it happen. And then there's the idea of James and John. Oh, we've been James and John. We've never been a sibling, we've been James and John. Do you ever live in one of those families where the kids, every kid wanted to be the parent's favorite one? That's James and John. Where they, they wanted to get the best seat at the table or the first crack at the food or uh, the, the best car to drive when they got to be driving age. It's no use giving a new driver a good car. They just have an accident. You just pray they don't have any accidents that hurt them tremendously. But James and John wanted to just kind of get an in with Jesus and make sure that when the glory came, they'd be right at the top of the line, right with Jesus and John, right with Jesus. Jesus kind of put them in their places. He said, wait a minute. Do you know what this entails to belong to me? to do the work that I do. And even if you do everything you feel called to do, it's not up to you where you sit in the, at the grand table. And the response of the ten, who felt like their brothers in this journey had tried to go behind their back and usurp a good place so that they'd have to sit farther down the table. Think about what's really important. There's no bad place at that table. There's no bad place at that table at all. Every one of us who belongs to Christ belongs at his table. Every one of us who belongs to Christ has gifts to give the world, has ways to be a witness to the truth, have ways to reach out to the poor, the suffering, the lonely. We each have something special we need to add to the world. And it doesn't matter where we sit at that table. We're still blessed and we've got a chair. So the passages take us all the way from God so far above people that they couldn't even fathom ever being okay with God to a transition all the way into the 2100s 
where we're still looking for our place in the kingdom, where we're trying to figure out how to live as good Christian folk, where we're still trying to see what it is that makes God happy. What makes God happy is for you to care. Care if somebody's hurting. Care if somebody's hungry. Care if somebody's at the point where they can't drive a car and you have to drive them. It's very humbling not to be able to drive, as I found out the last few months. I have to rely on Bill for everything. He leaves work to take me home for my doctor's appointments. My, my gosh, that's, that's commitment to a marriage. Every one of us has something to contribute, and unless we all do our parts, something's going to be left undone. I want you to think about that when you're making your uh, the chains for the Christmas tree, or when you're making your Swedish hearts or your angels. And I, I firmly hope that all of you take up the challenge and, and do those projects. We have to think about that as we end one era of the church and get ready for a new one. We're very hopeful we're going to have a new pastor with a new year. And that person will bring a whole new set of skills and vitality and possibilities to this place. We want as many people present here to help her accomplish those as we can. We are the church in this generation. We are God's hands in this community. And ours are the hands that can either push people away or bring them close. I used to teach the little kids in Sunday school a song, Grab Another Hand, Grab a Hand Next to You. Well, uh, COVID's kind of stopped that one, but um, the whole idea of fellowship being right at the heart of the Christian faith is a strong and healthy one. When we come together as a group of people, we are so much stronger than we ever would be if we were all just apart. We can do so much more when we respect each other, learn about each other, and use the skills each of us has to make our church a better place. So that's a challenge. That's our hope and our prayer is that this is this is a turning point for fuller views. I'd love to see fuller views. You know, I'm not having that surgery until right before Thanksgiving, so the next time I'm here, if you sit up a little farther, I might be able to see your faces, and then I'd know when to stop talking. Um, that's my cue, you know. I watch the congregation when I preach, and when they look like they've had enough, I stop. Today, you're forcing me to just decide without being able to see it. So remember, if you will, the things we learned today, that God is awesome, that God stands above creation, but that God also cares about creation, that God adjusted the way people thought about God and the world by sending Jesus and making a connection with human people that was so real and so vivid that it has lasted all these years and that we are the caretakers for our generation of that relationship. Our relationship is, is meant for us to go forth and act differently in the world because we belong to God. And whatever our skills start out as being, the skills needed to work for the kingdom will be made more by the God who calls us. We will be given what we need to be workers for the kingdom. And today, that's the good news. Amen. There's an affirmation in your bulletin that you may be wondering about. When I talk confirmation, one of the, one of the units that um, I had this amazing uh, 
uh, middle school teacher that I taught confirmation with. His, his name is Jason. And one of the things that we did was we, we, talked, we talked about how the first creeds came into being. The, the Nicene Creed uh, was one where the people were complaining and just really upset about each other's ideas of the faith and there wasn't any, any standard of the faith written down anywhere. And they started to fight in the streets about what it meant to be Christian. So the emperor at the time threw a bunch of people who didn't get along into a room and said, don't come out until you have a creed. It's really interesting what happens with middle school kids when they're given the following parameters. You have to say something about God, about Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and people. And then they start to brainstorm. And you might think middle school kids are pretty young to be doing that. But every year they came up with something that made me proud. I wish I'd saved all of them, but I saved a couple. This is, this is one of the affirmations that Jason and I developed with our confirmants in, in 20 years ago in the class of 2000. Um, please read it with me. We believe in one God who creates, who keeps us safe, who is, who cares, and who gives. God is everlasting and invincible. God gave us Jesus. We believe in Jesus the Christ. He changed the way we see God. Jesus brought peace, forgiveness, and love into our lives. He lived and taught compassion. He had the power to lead and the power to heal. Jesus sent us the Holy Spirit to help us grow, to be God with us, to give guidance, to give us the strength to endure. Thanks be to God. And I say to God, thank you for those confirmation kids. I hope they still remember that process. Let us come before God in a time of prayer, praying silently. Heavenly God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for music that inspires us. We thank you for forward movement in our search process. We thank you for people willing to use their gifts to your kingdom's glory. Help us to take the gifts you give us and make them more. We remember before you people who still struggle, people who are not financially stable, people who are hungry, people who are sick, people who have limitations they never would have dreamed possible. We remember before you the hopeful amazing joy journey of those who are about to give birth. May everyone feel your divine touch. May everyone feel the glory of a birth. Lead us forth into the future with realism but with hope. Help us to not be afraid to try new things. Help us to get excited again about being church people. Help us to remember that our little kids have the joy of Christmas morning imprinted in their souls and if we just look at them, we will never be truly hopeless. We bring all this before you and pray with the words of Jesus. The Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And give us not to temptation, but to the Lord.
closing hymn for today is 401, God in whom all life begins. <coughs> Thank you. 